Hello everyone, I'm Marsha Mott and welcome to UF Health Wellness, Wellness University webinar. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss women's heart health. I'd like you to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Linda Otolavaro. Dr. Otolavaro is an assistant professor of cardiovascular medicine at the UF College of Medicine. She earned her medical degree from the Universidad Libre School of Medicine in Cali, Colombia. She went on to complete her internship at the Universidad de Valle in Cali, Colombia. Before moving to the U.S. to complete her residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in cardiovascular diseases at the University of Miami. Before joining the University of Florida in 2019, she served as an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Kentucky Gill Heart and Vascular Institute. If you have any questions for our speaker today, you can submit written questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, I will ask our, your questions anonymously. We're going to answer as many questions as were possible today, and we will be recording today's webinar and we'll send out a link to the recording in a few days. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Is this looking okay for you? Yes, everything looks perfect. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, difficult times. Uh, we're working very hard to move on with our lives and trying to be, you know, as normal as we can. And God bless to all our, uh, all my colleagues and all the people working uh, during this COVID period. I want to talk about a, a, a topic that is a passion of me. Like, uh, as um, it was mentioned, I am a cardiovascular disease doctor, and I would like to talk to you about women's and heart disease. I'm going to focus on risk factors and symptoms. Uh, so let's get started. I just want to add, uh, I'm a non-invasive cardiologist, and I'm also a um, I also like to treat cholesterol uh, abnormalities. Uh, so I am a director of the lipid clinic here at the University of Florida. Oh, sorry. Okay, here. So today's section, uh, I will cover why women need to know about heart disease, what heart disease is, heart attack warning signs and survival, and getting on the road to heart health. So let's start say, just mentioning that over the past like many, many years or decades, we have had a bikini approach to women's health. And, and this is not only us, but just the society in general. I'm going to quote here Dr. Nanette Wenger. She is one of the uh, first female cardiologists who focused on women's heart health. And I quote, the community has viewed women's health almost with a bikini approach, looking essentially at the breast and reproductive system and almost ignoring the rest of the women as part of women's health. And I think this is very important because this is not only the society that thinks about a, 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 as women's health only in the bikini approach, but also us. And this is an opportunity to learn and then change some things of our uh, you know, daily life activities and also the way we think about our health. I want to show you this graph. Uh, this is a graph uh, from, uh, you know, a medical journal, and this is about cardiovascular disease mortality trends from 1979 to 2016. So here at the bottom, I have, we have years, 1979, 2016. Here in the vertical axis, we have deaths in thousands. In the blue line, we have the trends in males, and in the red line, we have women. If we see, we have this conception that, you know, women, we, we are protected, and then this is only like a male's disease. So in the 1970s, perhaps, males had more heart attacks and died more from cardiovascular disease. But if you see that the numbers were very high, 
by 1984 was the last time women had, less, uh, had lower mortality than men. And then with all the research and new treatments, male mortality starts going down. So, you know, we start saying, oh, we're doing a great job. But if you look at the red line, which is women, we have, you know, kind of flat line goes down a little bit and then it's just keep going up. And it's up to, you know, 1984 to year 2000, then really the medical society starts saying, okay, what's, what's wrong? That women are dying more from heart disease. So all these women like Dr. Uh, Wagner and others, and I'm gonna mention another uh, pioneer on, on this. Uh, they start pushing the medical societies to include women in research trials. So we get the treatment appropriate for women because we are different than men in some in some ways. So after the year 2000, you know, the AHA, the American Heart and, uh, and other medical societies started working on it. And then treatment and prevention measurements started in women. So mortality starts going down. And then unfortunately by the year 2014, 2015, mortality went up again and it's kind of stagnant, flat line. And then we're seeing that younger, people, especially younger women, are having more complications and, and are dying more from cardiovascular disease. So there is still a need for uh, more things needs to be done in order to be able to fight this pandemic, because this is another pandemic. Basic fact about women and heart disease. So heart disease is a leading cause of death in women in the United States and also is, a, is the leading cause of death in the world. Heart disease kills more women than all forms of cancer combined, unfortunately. It kills more than if you combine with accidents and even lung disease, which are very common. One in five women has some form of cardiovascular disease. After a myocardial infarction, like I mentioned before, younger women have higher complications, including death, compared to males and compared to older women. Heart disease can permanently damage your heart and your quality of life. And if heart disease, uh, we leave it untreated, it can cause serious, serious complications. So why me and why now? It's never too late. So young women, we need to take steps to protect our, our health uh, since the beginning, since we are teenagers, start having the idea is to have a good, uh, a healthy lifestyle. And this is something that is very easy to do, but sometimes it's, it's complicated uh, because there are things that we might not know and we believe we're doing something that is right, but we're probably wrong. And that's why things like this are very helpful to answer some of the questions that people may have. Then the risk rises in women ages 40 to 60, who are still very young women. And this is because maybe there is a, a they're going in through like a menopause period, and then the estro estrogen level starts going down. Many women develop one or more risk factors for heart disease during these years. For example, uh, they start or gaining weight or some of them because of depression start smoking um, or they develop abnormal glucose. So they start accumulating risk factors at this time of, uh, of age. Older women also need to take action against their risk. It is never too late for women to protect their heart health. So what is heart disease? There are many forms of heart disease. The most common one is coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease. Heart disease develops over years and progresses when the heart doesn't get enough nutrients. And I'll show you a graph. Why women don't take action against uh, heart health or heart disease, I'm sorry. So first of all, they think or we think is just a man's disease. And I'm gonna stop just a few seconds about this. Uh, I think this is interesting and you might find it interesting. So 
here on the, on, the, on the bottom right, I have a picture here to honor Dr. Bernard, uh, Bernadine Healy. She is another pioneer in cardiovascular disease and women's health. And basically uh, in the 1990s, she wrote an editorial to one of the big medical journals. It's called the New England Journal of Medicine. And she says at the time, that's when the graph you know, showed that the, the women had higher mortality than men. And she was kind of pushing to, you know, we have to do something. So she coined this gentle syndrome. Basically, she was saying that when women went to the hospital and had very different symptoms than men, they were not, they were probably not taken seriously. And then nobody thought they were having heart disease. So they had the heart attack or they, they were found, you know, with complications. So she mentioned the gentle because gentle here on the right is Barbara Streisand in a movie and she interpreted gentle. She um, used a costume, she dressed like a man. So she was able to study in, an, in a period of time in Europe that women were not allowed to study. So in order for her to be able to obtain all the benefits of being educated, she needed to be dressed like a man. So that's why she coined this term of the gentle syndrome, meaning and not even us, we're thinking about heart disease because heart disease is a man's disease. Or if we go to the hospital, nobody thinks that we're having heart disease. They, the other, you know, other thing that might, ha might happen and why we don't take action is because we don't have our health as a top priority. Uh, we are, or probably we're not enough to be at risk, or we're just too busy to make changes in our lives. We already have a lot of stress, too many tasks, you know, being in a house, being a wife, being a mother, mother, a daughter, sorry, and working, the ones who work. You know, it's very difficult, too many things. And because of, uh, because of all the things we have to do, and we always try to be, you know, the best we can, to do the best, or to do the best we can, we say we're probably tired. So most women don't know that heart disease is their own greatest health risk. And we must, I must repeat that heart disease is largely preventable and we need to take action to protect our hearts. Heart disease is a now problem. And later, maybe too late. So what is all this process of coronary artery disease? So a medical term, atherosclerosis, is what happens. Atherosclerosis is basically, this is a normal blood vessel, and this is a, a blood vessel that is diseased. What happens is, when we start aging, there is a process called atherosclerosis that means that it's hardening, a stiffening of the, of the uh, arterial uh, walls and basically they start getting fat accumulating in the wall and this fat starts growing that the lumen of the blood vessel is occluded. It starts getting narrow, narrow, narrow until the point that is limited oxygen to the organs and in this case to the heart. What are the risk factors for this atherosclerosis? So smoking is very, is very bad for our heart uh, and for our blood vessels health. High blood pressure is another uh, cause of um, you know, hardening or stiffening of the uh, blood vessels. High cholesterol, high triglycerides, overweight, obesity, physical inactivity, and diabetes is an independent risk factor. There are other risk factors that are more, that we can't change. And there are also another ones that are specific for women. For example, family history, we can change. So this is genetics. Women tend to have more autoimmune conditions like thyroid disease or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. So we take this into, into consideration when we are evaluating patients for uh, heart disease. And then the one specific for women, we have pregnancy associated complications. For example, the, the development of preeclampsia during pregnancy or postpartum or toxemia. 
diabetes during pregnancy or having preterm babies. Other population is the breast cancer survival, so chemotherapy or, or ladies who receive radiation therapy, they have higher risk to develop uh, heart disease. Depression is also something that nowadays we take into account uh, because of all the, the, the neurotransmitter changes that they have in the brain and also affect the heart, like stress, for example. So what is a heart attack? Uh, a heart attack occurs, so let's go back to the blood vessel I showed you before with the atherosclerosis. So here we have a blood vessel. We have this plaque build up, building up inside the blood vessel that is occluding the lumen. And then if something happens, you know, the blood pressure goes up, um, someone has very uncontrolled diabetes, smoking, then this plaque can rupture, and then there's a clot formation, and then the blood flow will just be interrupted. And then here, the blood vessel is here. If we have an interrupted blood supply to the heart muscle, there's gonna be an area of heart muscle that is going to suffer. And this is, you know, a dead heart muscle. This is what is a myocardial infarction. This is the way it looks. It's just a, a piece of heart that stops working. What are the symptoms? So we usually, we have seen, you know, even in the, in the news or in the, on TV that the person comes with their chest, with their fist in their chest, saying they have chest pain, they're short of breath, and, and they say, oh, it goes to my left arm. Yes, those are symptoms that are very common. Women can have those symptoms as well, but there are certain people that they don't feel it. So for example, some women sometimes come and they don't feel the typical chest pain. They might have sudden dizziness or they come with a lot of nausea and vomiting. They have an unusual fatigue or tiredness. They, they're like, it's, it's sweating, they're, they're breaking cold sweats, and they may have a heartburn. Elderly patients and diabetics may also have different symptoms than the typical chest pain. So that's why it's very important to know that besides the chest pain, there are other signs. And always if someone complains of this sensation of uh, impending doom, that's something that like I truly believe the patient if they feel something is not right with their body, they have to be evaluated by a physician. So they should go to the emergency department or call 911. So if you have symptoms suspicious of a heart attack, or if you think you are having a heart attack, you should call 911 immediately for emergency medical care. There are studies showing that only 65% of the women will call 911 first if they thought they were having a heart attack. However, they will call more than 80% a 911 for a friend. We need to learn the warning signs. Uh, calling 911 immediately, uh, it, it can save lives. So heart muscle is time, minutes counts. The emergency medical personnel will begin treatment at once. Try not to drive to the hospital, it can be dangerous. Uncertainty, uncertainty is normal and don't be embarrassed if they say everything was okay. We never feel that we're wasting our time. And uh, I, you know, we always prefer that, oh, you have a negative testing rather than, you know, you have a heart attack, stay home and have uh, bad consequences of that, from that. So what to expect if you go uh, and see, you know, uh, go to the emergency room or, or, or seek for medical advice. So one of the things that you're gonna have is an EKG. We call it EKG, which is an electrocardiogram. So here uh, you have one of the nurses putting these uh, cables with some stickers in your chest. This is uh, basically like a five or 10 minute procedure. These electrodes will capture the electrical activity of the heart and we will do an interpretation of that. A normal electrocardiogram will look like this. You now there are uh, narrow spikes. This is completely normal for us. 
And if someone is having a heart attack, then uh, I'm showing this because, you know, look at the difference. This is completely abnormal. And this is what we call, um, you know, when someone is having an acute myocardial infarction and we usually take them to the cath lab if we see something like that. Another thing that you might have is blood testing. Uh, so they will take blood samples uh, and one of the blood samples have something called cardiac enzymes. They might do one set or two sets. It depends of the results, you might get a third one. And the name of the test is called troponin. Uh, the troponins, if they are elevated, uh, this is associated with uh, heart damage. And, and this is when we think the patient has a heart attack or we confirm or diagnose. Um, myocardial infarction. What happens next? Patients can have a heart catheterization. This is basically um, small catheters or tubes that they go through the wrist or through the groin. And those catheters go all the way uh, to the heart and they locate the blood vessel. They use contrast. And basically this contrast will kind of draw the coronary and will show, you know, the, 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 if there is any blockage, it, it will locate it and it can tell us how bad it is. In general, we have three uh, blood vessels that supply our heart muscle. And uh, if we have a blockage, they will most likely put a stent. If the blockage is severe enough, uh, sometimes we call the cardiac surgeon to do a rapid evaluation and see and try to decide what's the best for the patient. Because remember, you won't have uh, heart, open heart surgery at that time. You know, that's something that is uh, prepared and, and you know, we, we discuss and, and, and things like that. It's not that you go immediately to the emergency, to the emergent uh, operation, only if it's an emergency, that's it. So this is how a cardiac catheterization looks like. So here in the left, we see, this is a blood vessel and here we see then is, there is a big narrowing. So this is a blood vessel called LAD or left anterior descending artery. And then here we call it 95% occlusion. And this is when we say, oh, you know, this uh, spot needs to be fixed. So they put a stent and this is how they look. Uh, I just want to tell you the stents are saved. These, you don't need to worry about, uh, you know, uh, them have to go, you know, in the future needs to be removed or something like that. The stents will stay there and also it will not move. It's very small. So uh, you don't need to worry about that. After someone has a stent, it's very important that they take all their medications and follow all the instructions and stop smoking if someone smokes. So um, there are other procedures like bypass surgery uh, and like I mentioned, and stents to open a, a blood vessel that is occluded. A procedures do not fix the damaged heart, it is already damaged, but helps a, with the treatment in trying to improve whatever is damaged. A, the condition worsens if untreated and might lead to disability or death. It might lead to something called a congestive heart failure. That's something that, or a diagnosis that a lot of people have heard when they come to clinic. And it's critical to realize that there is no quick fix for a heart disease. So we need to, uh, the best thing that we can do is prevent, prevention. The good news, again, heart disease can be prevented or controlled. Uh, we need to work on, a, uh, on lifestyle changes, sometimes medications if prescribed by a doctor. Some of the risk factors that we can control definitely include smoking, a high blood pressure with diet and medications, high blood cholesterol and triglycerides, overweight or obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, we can change that, and then diabetes also can be managed with medication. It's very important to talk about it. And, and when women go to their you know, primary care or healthcare provider, it's very important to talk about the risk. What's the risk of, uh, of having heart disease? I will suggest to prepare a list of questions before a visit. Also review your family history to see if there is anyone with heart disease, your 
parents, uh, uncles, and cousins, anybody, grandparents uh, who have any predisposition of heart disease, so you can uh, review that with your physician. And tell the, uh, your healthcare provider about any lifestyle behaviors such as smoking or being physically inactive. So you can work on it and, and improve your uh, risk factors. What kind of testing we do to assess heart uh, disease risk? Well, uh, when someone comes to our clinic, we definitely do vital signs, which include blood pressure. Uh, we do some testing uh, like cholesterol. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, one second. We do some testing like cholesterol, fasting glucose. Eh, we look at their weight, body mass index, and we measure the waist circumference. Eh, we do EKGs and some patients, not everybody, we do stress tests. We don't recommend doing a stress test as a routine eh, evaluation when they come to the, to the cardiology clinic. And then in some patients, we recommend something called coronary calcium score, not in everybody. These are some resources of information uh, about you know, women's uh, heart disease. And this is a nice picture of our clinic, uh, the US Cardiology Spring Hill. Uh, we have a preventive cardiology clinic and a lipid clinic. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you for that. We had a lot of great questions that came in. Um, let me think. Uh, here's a really good one. I thought, what causes nausea and vomiting related to a heart attack? I'm asking in order to differentiate between the co other causes of nausea or vomiting. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, um, that's a difficult question. So it has like two, two portions. So what causes uh, nausea and vomiting? So there is a type of heart attack that occurs in the inferior, like what we call the inferior aspect of the heart. And because it's very, you know, it's very close to the stomach, it's like here. So the irritation of that area is associated with the nausea, have all these like gastritis type symptoms. And, and then kind of like to differentiate between nausea from heart attack and nausea from, you know, gastric uh, uh, stomach issues, is for example, the nausea will be on exertion. So may not have any relationship with eating. And then the person says, oh, I go walk for two blocks and I start getting nausea. So then that type of nausea, we feel is suspicious of angina. And if it's an acute setting, definitely the history that we obtain from the patient is important. Okay, someone asked a question. Why do you measure waist circumference? That's a great question. So we measure waist circumference because the, the, you know, the bigger the waist circumference is, it's associated with what we call insulin resistance. So all the, the adipose tissue in our organs, you might have a skinny person, but if they have uh, you know, an increased waist circumference, uh, all uh, that uh, adipose tissue will increase the risk of having diabetes. And, and that is why it's very important for us to try to reduce the waist circumference because of the association of uh, diabetes. Okay. Someone asked, what's the ideal diet to prevent heart disease? And then someone also asked, is a vegetarian diet really important? So the so there are many, many studies and a lot of controversies regarding diet. Uh, definitely, I must say that in general, the studies have shown that if you reduce uh, red meat, processed foods, sweet beverages, and all, you know, mainly our standard American diet, which is fried food, then we have reduction in cardiovascular disease incidence. We always recommend the patients to increase their vegetables, their fruits, if they want to eat, you know, some type of meat we, or, or animal, we recommend fish over, over, you know, red meat or pork or, or chicken. And we might, we might say nuts is okay. So there is no perfect diet. And then when patients come, 
uh, we try to work with them with regards of what they want. If someone wants to become vegetarian or, or, or is interested in a plant-based diet, then that's a great diet. If someone says, no, I have to eat fish. So then fish, nuts, olive oil, like kind of like the Mediterranean diet that some studies have shown that it has some benefit in cardiovascular disease. Definitely a lot of controversies with ketogenic diet because all the proteins come from animal products and those have cholesterol. So in the long term, that kind of diet, we don't know what the effects on cardiovascular disease, but as a, cardio, as a cardiologist, we, we prefer more like the plant-based, maybe include some fish and not an olive oil. Okay, sounds good. What is a good uh, blood pressure for a man or a woman over the age of 85? That's a great question. So there was a study called the SPRINT trial. They actually took patients, uh, you know, on the high side, all the uh, older uh, ages, and then they they divided in, you know, treatment uh, to target 140s, and then treatment to be more like to the normal normal numbers, like 120s. Uh, so they found that there is improvement in mortality but they might have some side effects on the medication. So now when we have a patient in front of us, then we see, uh, you know, what's their quality of life, how they look, if they're very active, if they can tolerate, you know, the medications, we might target less than 130 over 80, just like somebody, like just like someone who's 60 or 50. But if the person takes a lot of medications, is frail, then we might, you know, we might allow uh, a little bit higher blood pressure, but in general, we want to treat uh, everybody the same. Okay, good information. Um, someone asked a question. My total cholesterol is under 200, but my good cholesterol is off the chart high. Should I be worried? So the good cholesterol is the one that actually takes cholesterol out from the blood vessels and takes it for elimination. So the good cholesterol, we want it to be high. I would say we should be worried if there is family history of heart disease. And then, you know, there are some analysis that we could do if the HDL, you know, is, is a good HDL or if it's one of the HDL that also takes a cholesterol to the arteries. But in general, having a high cholesterol is a good thing. Okay, good to know. Um, in regards to lifestyle, does stress or anxiety have an impact on heart health issues or heart disease? Yes, that's a great question. And actually I included as a risk factor depression. So depression slash anxiety slash stress. So stress is a component of uh, you know, a risk factor because if you're stressed, your adrenaline will go up, your blood pressure can go up, your heart rate goes up. So um, if your blood pressure is up, you have increased risk of heart disease. So definitely stress, uh, we do believe is a, is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and we need to work on that. Okay. Um, someone says, I notice sensations around my heart, kind of anxiety, like during a hot flash. Could this be connected to my heart health? It's always important to, you know, look uh, and, and talk to the person and, and, and have a sense of the big picture. Uh, when someone has uh, hot flashes may have other symptoms. Uh, some of the patients uh, having hot flashes also have like palpitations. So maybe the discomfort is a palpitation. And so that's why the discussion with the physician or your cardiologist is very important to try to determine exactly what is that, what is that you're feeling. And usually the, when the symptoms are at rest and not associated with exertion, we don't think is, you know, like a heart blockage. Okay, thank you. Someone asked an interesting question. Is it okay to consume coconut oil or coconut milk? I've been told I should limit coconut oil because it's a saturated fat. That's, that's true. So okay. there, there, are, there is some data like, seeing what's the content of saturated fat with different uh, oils and coconut oil is one of, at the top has the increased saturated fat so please 
like this courage they use of like one spoon in the morning of coconut oil has too much saturated fat and that's the fat that goes into our blood vessels. Darn, it seems like it's a, it's a, you know, I guess it's a nut technically, but yeah. Um, someone asked a question about, um, does a lipid clinic offer alternatives to statins other than diet and exercise in order to lower your cholesterol? So there are medications uh, besides statins. Uh, we have different options. We definitely have to, we should try the statins and then sometimes in order for those new medications to be approved, uh, we have to document that we have tried to challenge the patients with statins. Otherwise the insurance will deny those medications. Statins have um, a lot of bad propaganda, um, but they, they are the medications that have shown that really improves outcomes, prevents heart attacks and strokes, and also reduce the risk of having a second event. So definitely, despite you know someone comes and tells me I don't I don't want to study, definitely I'm open to discuss any questions about you know the bad propaganda of the statins or any of the side effects. If the patient has a true you know intolerance to statins, then obviously there are other uh, medications. There are options that are over the counter that sometimes we discuss, but that's something that I won't actively prescribe because they are not FDA. But if the patient is, uh, you know, wants to take them, then, you know, I kind of like help to follow monitor for side effects, but, but we have options, definitely. Okay. So I think maybe they were also asking, maybe they had heard about, maybe we have a, a program or a, like a clinic day that just helps m people manage that. Is that maybe, is there another thing you could see a cardiologist for where they, I always get a lot of questions where people are like, oh, I don't want to take a medicine. I want someone to help me work with all these other different ways I can do that. So is there a special program or a clinic or anything where that's done? Or is that just really done with every cardiologist that, that works with patients? So we have a preventive cardiology clinic. Uh, we have one of the interventional cardiologists who likes plant-based diet and also my, myself. I do lipid clinic and obviously, you know, with lipids, we, we treat with statins and other medications. So um, what we do, we see patients for the lipid clinic the first Thursday of the month, and then we definitely try lifestyle. But if the patient has very, very high risk, we, or I tend to, you know, evaluate, you know, what's the risk or if this, uh, there is a genetic condition, sometimes we do genetic testing. And if the person has, if we find disease, then we definitely, have a, a, an agreement or like we discuss what's the best uh, way to treat them because sometimes we must do medications but if they don't want to then we do lifestyle okay someone asked if you could repeat what you'd said about sometimes maybe a stress test is not always recommended are there times when someone might need one but you wouldn't do it no, I said, I, I said it because when someone just comes to the cardiologist, it's not like in, during the first visit, they will get EKGs, blood tests, and a stress test. It's not like a, a routine. So every time you go to a cardiologist, you're going to go ready for, you know, a treadmill test. No, if someone gets a stress test, uh, if they're having symptoms, if they don't have symptoms, then we don't do it. We do other, other things to evaluate patient's risk. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, someone has a, a question says, is a stint placed when you're in the ER? How long does it take to do everything that would be mentioned like in a, in a situation where you're having a heart attack uh, or a blockage? Mm -hmm. So let's put the scenario. So if someone uh, has a heart attack, calls 911, they, they diagnose with a heart attack in, in the ambulance. From the ambulance, the paramedics will call you know, the hospital and a an interventional cardiologist will notify. They also sometimes are able to send pieces of the EKG. And if it's very clear that the picture I show you, then once the patient uh, enters the ER, they do a full 12 lead EKG. They get you know, IVs, uh, they get some samples when they're getting the IVs. 
Um, if they confirm the EKG, they, the patient is having a heart attack, the cardiologist is there, they open the cath lab, they go to the cath lab, and then they put the catheters. If they see the blockage, they put the stent. So actually, the, the, there are uh, quality measures, and then the, the blood vessel needs to be open in 90 minutes. So the, the, the sooner you know, we open the blood vessel, we can save that piece of muscle that uh, has no blood flow. Okay, good. Can, um, maybe not in this exact situation you just described, but let's say someone needs to get a stent and there's a lot of atherosclerosis, can they still get a stent? Uh-huh. So um, sometimes people have completely occluded blood vessels and they are like chronic because this is, this is a process that takes years uh, and they're very calcified. So interventional cardiologists, they have different catheters and, and different techniques and tools to open. So I have seen them opening like completely occluded blood vessels with different techniques that, that you know, helps to remove some of the calcium so they're able to get the catheters in the, in the blood vessel and on to the stent. So yeah, it can be done. Okay, someone asked a question that says, I have PVCs that has sent me to a cardiologist for further evaluation. I've researched it and I realize it's really quite common. What percentage of PVCs is a problem? When do you know that you need more help for that? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So PVCs is very common is what some people call a skip beat. So they say, oh, I skip a beat and then my heart stops and then I have another beat. So that's usually what people describe as a PVC. The way we diagnose that is putting a halter. So in the halter, the, the computer will count how many of those PVCs the person is having in 24 hours. So we use like a, a burden, a percentage. So if the person is having more than 10% of the entire beat as PVCs, then we usually refer the patients to an electrophysiologist after we start medications like beta blockers, like metoprolol. If, if, or if the patient has a lot of symptoms and if medication doesn't, doesn't help, then the electrophysiologist uh, can do an ablation. An ablation procedure is uh, they go with catheters also, and, and then they, they burn the, the area where we think the PVCs are originating in the heart. A PVC is just an electrical uh, problem. So they just burn that area and then they cure it. Okay. Um, so I've got a lot of questions about AFib. Um, someone says, you know, I have a strong history of AFib. I keep my weight in check. I exercise. Is there anything else I can re do to reduce my risk? That's a great question. Atrial fibrillation is the, one of the most common arrhythmias. And, and then by my generation, I think we, we're going to have a fib just like now people have hypertension. It's very, very common. So genetics, we can change that. But if you keep your weight stable, if you exercise, and if you avoid you know, too much uh, alcohol or caffeine, you will decrease your risk of developing uh, atrial fibrillation. So lifestyle is very, very important. Okay. Um, is, if you have AFib, does that mean that you have heart disease? AFib is, is, is a different type of heart disease than the electrical uh, problem. It's very different of coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease. When it says coronary, it's like blockages. And then AFib is just uh, an electrical problem from the heart. So it, it is a heart disease, but in a different context uh, with regards to the electrical uh, abnormality of the heart. Okay. And a couple people must know that, that AFib puts you at increased risk for uh, a stroke, but does AFib also put you at higher risk for a heart attack? Not really. The, 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 the problem with atrial fibrillation is if it's untreated, like you said, a, Marcia, is an increased risk of stroke uh, because uh, this irregular bead uh, makes that the blood doesn't flow uh, in the left atrium, in the upper chamber of the heart. And there is an area that we have a little pouch in the back 
that if blood flow doesn't occur normally, you can have a clot there. So sometimes that clot that gets dislodged, if it's formed, it gets dislodged and goes to the brain. And then the other thing that occurs is patients may develop heart failure because of this irregular heartbeat or if the heartbeat is very fast, then the heart gets tired and then gets dilated and, and the person develops heart failure. So it can cause heart failure, which is pretty serious, but not associate, not that if you have a fib, you have an increased risk of having a heart attack, okay? Okay. Um, so you mentioned heart failure. Is heart failure related to a low heart rate or is a low heart rate a bad thing? A low heart rate, uh, if you have no symptoms, is completely normal. In fact, uh, if someone has heart failure, they develop tachycardia. They're actually, the heart rate is, is going to the opposite, it's going fast. And, and one of the medications we give is actually to reduce the heart rate. So again, having a, a slow heart rate, if the person is completely, you know, have no symptom, is normal. And the normal values are around 55, 60 beats per minute. That's, uh, or, you know, 60, 50. If person is completely asymptomatic, has no problem with that. Okay. Um, what does it mean if you, someone says you have a stiff heart muscle? Yes, a stiff heart muscle is, is what we call diastolic dysfunction. So the heart contracts in systole and relax in diastole. So when you have a stiff muscle, the relaxation is very abnormal. So the person, even though might have a good pumping function, if you don't relax, you don't allow to the blood to come to the heart and then be pumped normally. So if you have a stiff muscle, you might, you know, just pump and then some of that blood will go backwards. So it behaves like a heart failure. So that's why sometimes when patients uh, have symptoms or go to the hospital, they're diagnosed with heart failure but then they get confused because the heart pumping function is good, but it's because their heart is a stiff. And the medications for that, basically what we do is we manage fluids, but the best thing for a stiff heart is exercise. That's okay. the best thing. All right. Um, we had a question that's a little bit unrelated, but definitely a question I think you could answer. Um, Someone said that they received um, a COVID vaccine and they felt like they developed AFib shortly after having that. Is that something that there's been any uh, correlation with or is it something that, that anybody else has reported? So the CDC has, uh, is receiving all the information from the patients and then we have had uh, consultations from patients uh, that have palpitations. Uh, there is not like a you know, cause effect uh, between the COVID vaccine and the development of palpitations. Now, if someone has predisposition of, for AFib, and let's say they develop fever because of the vaccine, then those patients can go into atrial fibrillation because of the fever, but not because of the components of the vaccine. So again, there is no evidence or like we haven't heard anything from the CDC saying that there is a cause effect in between the COVID vaccine and, and atrial fibrillation. But it is true that some patients have complained about palpitations and sometimes the symptoms are significant enough that we put monitors to make sure the patient actually is doing fine. Okay. We got another menopause question. Is it true that menopause can cause elevated cholesterol rate? I brought my cholesterol down, but it's still a little over 200. My doctor wants to try a statin when I go back to see them, but I'm active, eat good, healthy foods, and I don't want to get stuck on a medicine. So uh, when the estrogen starts going down, there is in fact changes in, in our cholesterol. So the, the bad cholesterol starts going up and the good cholesterol starts going down. So that's probably one of the reasons why your cholesterol has changed. And also, uh, with regards of statins, an indication for it, in our guidelines for primary prevention of heart disease, we take into account you know, age, gender, risk factors, and the cholesterol numbers. And then we can determine who will need, who will benefit the most uh, from statins. 
So if you have this discussion with your doctor, they're able to assess if you will be one of the, the you know, one of the persons that benefit the most. And there are other ways to evaluate risk. Like for example, a coronary calcium score, sometimes we recommend that. And basically the, the idea is to see if the person has calcium in the coronaries. And if they have calcium, then definitely the statins will, will help reducing you know, the risk of having heart disease or heart attack. Okay. Um, if someone has received a stent, will they ever have that removed if their condition improves? No, the stents will stay. Stay forever. So the body kind of, uh, you know, the gross tissue on top of the, the stent. Uh, so it will, it will never come out. Besides, so small that trying to take that out is more harmful than beneficial. Okay. So it will stay there. No worries. It won't move. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me what the difference between a PAC and a PVC is? Sure. So a PAC is a premature atrial contraction and a PVC is a premature ventricular contraction. So the A and the V is just telling us where the extra beat is coming from. So the PAC is coming from the atria, which is the upper chamber. And the PVC is from the lower uh, or, or, or the lower chambers of the ventricle. Okay. And it's just a skip beat. The difference is where the skip beat is coming from. Okay. Uh, would a pacemaker ever be used for a PVC versus ablation? Oh, no. 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 Uh, definitely not. Okay. Could you talk about taking a low dose aspirin? Yes, that's a great question. So there are, there has, aspirin has been around for so many, many years. And in the past, we used to, or I used to hear, you know, my, you know, grandparents taking aspirin to prevent heart disease. Uh, nowadays, there's a recent study showing that actually increased uh, GI bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding, um, and not much beneficial. So for patients above 75 years of age, a, and if they do not have any evidence of heart coronary artery disease, we do not recommend aspirin on them. However, we do recommend statins, but aspirin, no. And then if you're younger, then only if you have significant risk factors like smoking or diabetes, very, very high cholesterol, or there is another lipid that um, I usually check that is called lipoprotein little a that is associated with heart disease. If someone has a very high lipoprotein little a, I tend to give an aspirin. So it depends on every person. And it's not a recommendation now that we give aspirin to every single person. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got a couple questions. You mentioned um, genetic testing or some genetic defects that people might have. Could you address who or why would be tested and should their children be tested as well? Sure, that, thank you for allowing me to talk about it. So there is something called familiar hypercholesterolemia. Familiar hypercholesterolemia is very common. It's a genetic condition. It's, it's, it's actually very common. One in 200 people might have familiar hypercholesterolemia they don't know. And these are the people who have high cholesterol and they have heart attacks in their 40s. So basically we have to suspect familiar hypercholesterolemia if someone has a bad cholesterol above 200 and any family history of heart disease if, for example, in, the, in their parents or, or like cousins, siblings, under the age of 65 for females or 55 for males. And then we do genetic testing, trying to identify who has the mutation, because if someone has it, then we will test their kids, their brothers and sisters, and probably their parents if they're, they're still uh, alive, in order to prevent a disease in patients who have not developed any, any of the signs. So if someone has children, then definitely, and they are, you know, they have positivity of the genetic, the abnormal genetic testing. Yes, the kids should be tested. And it's exactly when we want to start doing a prevention. So the kids don't have any problems when they grow up. So that's a great question. Okay, thank you. How does your heart health relate to your lungs and breathing? So if the heart is damaged, for example, if someone develops a big heart attack and develop heart failure, 
and the pumping function stops working in the normal way, then the blood starts accumulating in the lungs. So that's why patients with heart disease uh, have a lot of shortness of breath, have, because they have fluid in their lungs. And then if you have fluid in your lungs, your lungs are unable to do the normal you know, oxygenation of the blood. So that way your heart will be affected. If someone has a lung disease that is bad enough, then can damage the right side of the heart and then develop heart failure symptoms because of a lung disease. So heart and lung are very connected. You know, the right side of the heart takes blood to the, oxy to the, to the lungs for oxygenation and then from the lungs go to the left and then from the left goes to the body. So it's a circuit, everything is connected, so. Um, couple last questions. Can anybody work with a nutritionist or a dietitian to help improve their diet? And how does that, how do you get that started? Absolutely. If someone has access to, to a, a dietitian, then they will assess, you know, they, they will have a discussion of what's their daily, daily, uh, you know, eating habits. And then from there, they start building, you know, if they say, oh, I eat only one fruit a week then they say, oh no, well, you have to, you're gonna eat three or more fruits and these are the fruits that you're gonna eat and then you're gonna eat this amount of vegetables, let's cut on this, let's drink this. So a dietitian is very helpful. And if someone has access to it, uh, then uh, I think they should go for it and, and work with them. It's, it's, it's and so their, that... their primary care or their cardiologist could refer them? Absolutely. And if someone has a, a diabetes, then they, they usually, the diabetes clinic, they usually have a diabetic educator and then they, they provide information about uh, diet as well. Or for example, if someone has a heart attack, after the heart attack, they refer to cardiac rehab. In cardiac rehab, they receive dietitian, uh, you know, dietary information as well. So yeah. Okay. Um, and then here, if you have heart disease or you suspect you have heart disease, what's one thing you should do immediately? What, what's one thing you could change right now? If you are home and you, if you think you have heart disease, you have to see a doctor. You start with your primary care doctor and, and then, you know, they will evaluate your risk factors and then the primary care doctor will determine if if, if you need a cardiologist or you can go straight to a cardiologist and, and have you know a, your questions written down a, review your family history and then they will do some testing to assess a, what's the next best step in the management if you need statins or or if you need aspirin in case you're one of those people who who needs aspirin because your risk is elevated mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the question that everybody always likes to ask during these, is chocolate good or bad for your heart? <laughs> Black chocolate, dark chocolate is good. <laughs> we actually, they say, is, the, is the one of the desserts that we say oh, it's okay to do it. The issue with the chocolate is the, uh, you know, the amount. I mean, if we overdo it, then we will gain weight. And that's not good. And then if you have palpitations, sometimes we would recommend to avoid too much chocolate because chocolate contains a little bit of caffeine. So dark chocolate is okay. Just one little piece. Don't overdo it. Okay. And then is a smartwatch a reliable EKG? Or is that really just all, is it helpful or is it just kind of a gimmick? I have, I have a patients who have shown the, the, their EKGs and, and sometimes have been helpful. Uh, so they're getting better on, on the tracings. Uh, however, we don't rely 100% on the, on, 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 the, on the EKGs on the you know, Apple Watch or whatever. Uh, we definitely do an event monitor because we want to have a, you know, a complete assessment of the heart rhythm, but they are helpful. So helpful, but maybe not necessarily a reason to go out and buy one. Huh? Oh, oh yeah. No. Okay. All right. Well,